right, thank you, thank you so much, Corey and Kayla. Uh, we appreciate you guys being with us today and, and leading us, and, and what a week. Uh, my goodness, good morning. Tracy, you awake? Are you good? Okay, she's here. All right, Jean got you here. That's good. That's good. Uh, what, a, what a week, my goodness. The, the, the things that I observed this week and witnessed and, and watched this church do and, and watching you guys serve and watching these kids, uh, I was absolutely blown away. I just, you know, just absolutely blown away. I, I just, I've, I've sat more and just cried this week over just joy, just from watching everybody serving and, and doing so much this week. It's just, I, I can't even begin to, you know, God is so good and you guys are so faithful. And, and so that's, and God's going to do an amazing thing with that. Uh, you just need to know that. I mean, we, we have 11 professions of faith. That's just the beginning, I really believe. And just, just being here and watching all these kids this week and just come in. When I came in here Thursday night, I was like, oh, my gosh, this place is full of kids and, and just an amazing week. And, and it just tells me and shows me that there's a hunger. Uh, there's a hunger in our community. There's a, there's a desire in our community, and there's just a, a, a reaching out. And I, I just see things beginning to move in that great direction. So uh, let's, let's not let the fire be quenched. Uh, we're going to continue this morning uh, in our series, Prepare the Way. And, and as we uh, reflect a little bit on Vacation Bible School, as we enjoy, um, you know, the Moore family is just absolutely amazing. When I, when I go back through our history together and, and how we've worked together and what a, what a team that God assembled here uh, at Living Faith and, and just an incredible uh, family and an incredible work that they do with our kids. And, you know, in my life as a pastor... I've always learned this, and in over 20 years, uh, <laughs> and I used to kind of think this was negative, and I didn't ever like it because of that, but I would always hear this. Whenever you'd have a great week, whenever things would go super well, or you would see amazing things happen, somebody would always say, well, you know what's coming next, you know? Yeah, I know what's coming next, an attack. It's just, it's, it's biblical. And, and, and so, but we don't have to be afraid of that. We don't have to be afraid of that. We don't have to be negative about that. And, and, but we do need to be aware of it, I believe. And, and, and so when, whenever you see something uh, great take place uh, for the Lord, you realize that that draws Satan's attention. And as it draws his attention, you can expect that there will be an attack. But God's people can be ready for that. We can be prepared for that. And we can be uh, knowledgeable in how to respond to that and, and, and just continue moving forward. And today we're going to continue in this F260 series as we have read this week uh, uh, about Nehemiah, and we've kind of tr tracked through this whole um, time frame with the Israelite people, and now we're post-exile, and we're in the rebuilding uh, phase. And so we're going to kind of set the context to begin this morning uh, in Israel's history so that we understand where we are with the nation of Israel in captivity. Uh, we we re read about and we read about this constant pattern of Israel's disobedience, and, and that pattern of disobedience, that pattern of turning away from God's word, that pattern of, of doing those things wrong, uh, led to the separation of the northern and southern kingdoms. And, and as we've read through that history, we uh, ultimately see the fall of both kingdoms. We, we see the fall and the exile of all the people. The northern kingdom falls to Assyria. The southern kingdom falls to Babylon. And after the period of exile, Babylon falls to Persia. And as we read through the book of Ezra, we see that permission was granted to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And so God had promised there would be a remnant. God had promised that even though this exile would take place, even though, though the kingdom would fall, even though it would look bad, even though it was going to be very dim, even though it was going to be a time of, of great distress, that he would preserve his people. He would preserve his plan. And so now we begin to see that unfold. And, and in Nehemiah, the temple has been rebuilt, but the two and a half mile wall around the city had not been rebuilt. And, and, and so this is, this is what we see, and this is how we, we understand. In Ezra, God restores his people by rebuilding the temple. In Nehemiah, God protects his people by building the wall. Okay? He protects his people by building the wall uh, around the city and around the temple in Jerusalem. And, and so here's the lesson overview for today. As we dive into this, as we get into this, God is still very much in the business of protecting his people and protecting his work. He's very much in the business of protecting his people and protecting his work. And, and this is why that this is very important. We as God's people have a common enemy. 
We have a common enemy against God's work and against his will, and that is Satan. And, and, and so we need to understand him, and we need to recognize his attack plan, and we need to know that attack plan. And when we understand it and we know it, we can defend against it. Most importantly, we allow God to defend against it because God will fight for us. We have to understand and be prepared. And so as God's people, we have this common enemy, a common adversary. Peter speaks about him in the New Testament, 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 8. He reminds us. He says, be alert and of sober mind. Your enemy, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. Now that's a description. It's a description. And from that description, we should get an understanding about how Satan attacks us. Because a lion is something that we know. A lion is something that we understand. A lion is a predator. Okay, How does God describe his people? We're the sheep of his pasture. We're prey. Okay, We, are, we require a shepherd <laughs> to protect us. All right? I've, 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 I've raised a few sheep. Okay? Now, sometimes it's really not a term of endearment, folks. Okay? Sheep are come, some, one of the dumber animals I've ever dealt with. All right? I mean, they make really dumb mistakes, don't we? Okay? Don't we sometimes? I mean, we make some really dumb mistakes. We really need somebody to lead us and guide us. My cows pretty much take care of their own. I mean, sometimes I'll get busy, and it's like, I need to go check on them. I haven't even seen them, you know? It's like, I need to go count and see if they're even there. And lo and behold, most of the time, when I go out to check on them, they're fine. But a sheep, if I were to leave that many sheep out in my pasture and go back in a couple of weeks, there wouldn't be anything to find. They would be gone. They would be gone. They require a shepherd. They require constant care. And, and, and so, and this is the reason why we have to have a shepherd to protect us and to, and to look over us. Because as a predator, the lion seeks who he may devour. A, a predator has a calculated plan of attack. If you've ever watched predators work, if you've ever watched anything about that, they don't just go running wildly. When you see them running after an animal, it's after they've watched it for a while. They study. They'll look. They'll look. I remember uh, I was duck hunting a long time. We are goose hunting. We were out in the bottoms. It was in, the, in a field. And I, there, were, there was ducks flying over the cornfield. And so I picked up my duck call. And there was a coyote. I guess he was probably over a mile away. And he was not even anywhere around where we were at. And I just gave a little duck chuckle, just a little feeding chuckle. And when I did, I seen that, I seen that coyote. He just turned. He stopped and he turned and he looked in our direction. He's like, duck, duck breakfast sounds pretty good to me. And so he began a plan of attack moving in on our decoys. He started right then. He, he kind of got low and started moving away. And he started devising how he could sneak up on what he thought was going to be dinner for him. See, predators have a calculated plan of attack. They, 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 they observe first. And then after they observe, then they devise a plan. And then they move and they, and they, and they go through with the plan. And, and here's the thing. As Christ followers, we need to realize that when good things happen in the kingdom of God, it draws the attention of Satan. He, he's roaming back and forth across the earth, seeking whom he may devour. And, and so when good things happen in God's kingdom, it draws his attention. And so while we're in the middle of the business of good things, while we're in the middle of the business of good work, he is, it, it gets his attention. Okay, It gets his attention. He hears it. And, and, and so while, while we are doing what God's asked us to do and, and trying to be obedient, it, it, it awakens the awareness of the lion, and we know that it invites his attack. But here's the thing. We don't have to live in fear of that. Because, because the natural reaction was, it would be, well, if, if that's going to invite his attack, then we need to be quiet. And that would be wrong. <laughs> because then we would be going against what God has called us to do. And, and so we don't have to be afraid of Satan's attack, but we need to understand it. We need to understand how it comes, and we need to understand how he prepares against us, and then we need to prepare ourselves with God's protection. We have to be able to recognize the attacks of Satan and then be able to overcome them. So in Nehemiah chapter 6, there's three methods that Satan uses to disrupt and destroy our lives, and he used these men in, in, uh, in the book of Nehemiah to, to execute these things against Nehemiah as he was trying to build the wall. And we're going to kind of unpack these things this morning and look at how Satan comes against us. Nehemiah chapter 6, verses 1 through 4 is where our story begins. 
When the word came to Sanballat, Tobiah, Geshem the Arab, and the rest of our enemies, and there's the key thing where we begin to see that, 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 that Nehemiah is doing the work of the Lord, and these are not God's people, and so these are the enemies, and, and, and so he has rebuilt the wall, and there's not a gap left in it. But where it is, is that he hadn't set the doors in the gates. Sanballat and Geshem sent me this message. Come, let us meet together in one of the villages on the plain of Ono. But they were scheming to harm me. So I sent messengers to them with this reply. I'm carrying on a great project and cannot go down. Why should the work stop while I leave it and go down to you? Four times they sent me the same message. Each time I gave them the same answer. The first method that we see used by Satan is distraction. It's a simple thing. It's a simple thing. The first method that, that Satan will use against a church that, that is doing things that, that, that are, are moving and growing the kingdom of God, the first, the first plan of attack that he will always use is distraction because it's simple. It, it seems to be nonviolent. It seems to be not that big of a deal. And so they just simply said, hey, come down for a meeting. Okay? You know, how many times have you, how many wasted days have you ever spent in meetings? Oh, my goodness. I'm a school teacher, right? And so I understand. And so in this, we have to, we have to keep our focus on Jesus. Sanballat, Tobiah, and Geshem are enemies of Israel. Let's look back in Nehemiah chapter 2, verse 10. And we kind of get the, uh, the, uh, the back story here a little bit. of their, When Sanballat, the Horonite, and Tobiah, the Ammonite, uh, whenever they heard this, they were much disturbed that someone had come to promote the welfare of the Israelites. When, when they're coming to, to build this wall, see this wall is protection. This wall is protection for the city. And so when they found out that things were happening and that, and that Israel and that, that Jerusalem was being rebuilt, it, it, uh, it disturbed them. Nehemiah 2:19 says, "But when Samballat the Horonite, Tobiah the Ammonite official and Geshem the Arab heard about it, they mocked and ridiculed us. What is this that you are doing, they asked. Are you rebelling against the king? Nehemiah 4, chapter, or verse 8 says, They all plotted together to come and fight against Jerusalem and stir up trouble against it. So, so we see that, that this is what enemies do. Enemies plot and they develop plans of attack. Now, none of these men wanted, it, wanted Jerusalem rebuilt. And, and the reason why is because it was financial competition. Uh, if you look at the geography and where each of these three men were governors or where they were leaders in their districts, then this was going to create a place that was going to be economically competitive uh, and, and particularly uh, cause them economic issues. And, and so they, they did not want uh, Israel or, or Jerusalem being uh, back as uh, strong as it was about to be. And so the, verse, the first tactic that they use is a very common tactic that Satan uses today, and that is distraction. Okay? In education, uh, we, we commonly call this meetings, okay? Sometimes we have meetings about meetings, all right? I, I call them Freddie Fender meetings, right? Wasted days and wasted nights. Is that what I'm saying? That's, that's, I've, I've spent a lot of time like that, right? It's just distracting. It's like I'm trying to teach school here. I'm trying to do this. We're trying to get something done, and I'm sitting here talking about something that's meaningless, right? And sometimes we have to step back and say, wait a minute, is this going to matter in, in, a, in a day, a year, a, a month? You know, what, is this, this, does this really matter? Does this really take time? And so sometimes we have to just stop and, and, and figure if, uh, if it really is because they're just simply saying, hey, Nehemiah, come down for a meeting. Just come on down. We need to talk about what's going on. Just kind of spend some time. And it's like, wait a minute. Second Corinthians chapter, uh, chapter 11, verse 3, uh, it says, But I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived, this is Paul writing, uh, by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. It's distracting. Okay? And, and so that's what can happen in churches so, so easily. As you, as you begin to grow and things begin to happen, then all of a sudden it becomes so distracting. There's so many things that come in. And, and, and this is Satan's way of trying to, to, to draw our attention away from the good work. And this is what Nehemiah responded by saying, I'm doing a great work. I'm doing a great project. I am doing what God has directed me to do. And so I don't have time <laughs> to pull away from this assignment and to come down for a meeting. I just don't have time for that. And so when we're doing God's will in a place that God wants us, that is a great work. 
And, 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 there, and here's something that we might notice. This was pretty hard work. Nehemiah had a pretty good deal. If you go back and remember, his, he was the cupbearer to the king. Okay, and, and Unless there's an attack on, on the king's food, uh, you've got a pretty sweet deal. Okay, Because you're at his table. Everything he eats, you eat. Okay, You're the taste tester. All right? and, and so you're in the presence of the king. You're right there beside him. Every meal, you're at his table. Uh, that's about as easy and a, and, a, and, a, and a good job as you can possibly have. And Nehemiah was like, yeah, I'm going to start. I'm going to go out back home uh, to a place that I've really never even been. And, 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 and I'm going to construct a wall and I'm going to do concrete work. Okay? I mean, when you're on the concrete crew, <laughs> that's a hard job. And, and so he left a really easy job and went to a dip. But the reason he went there is because God called him there. He, he, he was, he was, he, he was in, in tears because he knew that that wall was broken down and in disrepair and needed to be rebuilt. God called him there. And so when we are doing God's will in a place that God wants, we are doing a great work. So he left the servants of an earthly king to go and serve the king of kings. What makes our assignments worthy is not what we are doing, but who we are working for. I, I saw a lot of selfless service this week from some of you guys. Okay, I mean, Some of you guys have worked hard in your life, and, and so many of you have, and, and you've earned the right to rest, and you've earned the right to retirement, and you've earned the right to go sit somewhere on a beach. And, and, and for some people, the last thing that they would imagine doing is pouring Kool-Aid and putting uh, 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 bagel bites on plates for kids. Okay? That I'm not going to spend my time doing that. I'm going to go somewhere and relax and enjoy life. You see? But that's not what God called you to do. And so when I see that, it's, not, it's, not, it's, not, it's about serving the king. And the joy that you experience when you're doing that is just contagious because it has nothing to do with the task at hand. It has everything to do with who we are doing it for. And so here's the thing. What makes our assignments worthy is not what we're doing, but who we're working for. And we saw that this week. See, here's, here's Satan's tactic in this. Christianity is a daily practical commitment to Christ. It's a daily practical commitment to Christ. And, and, and we have to be faithful wherever God has us. We have to be faithful wherever he has us. We, we are to be obedient wherever God has us. It may not be our plan. It may not be what we wanted. It may not be the, the, the assignment that we, that we had. You know, I'll, I'll never forget Frank Doris was one of my mentors. And Frank pastored uh, for 30, 40 years he was the director of missions at Warren Association of Baptists, and then he retired from that, and then he took a, a small church there, Big Muddy, uh, in Gasper River Association, and pastored that small church after he had pastored multiple large churches, and he, he served that church, and then he served our association as an interim director of missions, and then he went back to another. And, and after 50-plus years of ministry, uh, the last time that I, I talked to Frank, he handed me his, his new business card, <laughs> and it had his contact information and his phone number, and it didn't have titles and 40 years of ministry and doctorate of ministry and trained it at Golden Gate Sim. It didn't have any, it just said Frank Doris, willing to serve. I put that in my pocket and I still have it. Frank Doris, willing to serve. Now that says something. I mean, he has all these titles, he has all these degrees, but it doesn't matter if you need me to come and serve Kool Aid to kids, I'll do it. Willing to serve. There's a willingness. When we have a willingness in our heart to serve Christ wherever he has us, doing whatever he wants us to do, we're to be obedient uh, to that. The, there's a common mistake about the gospel. This is, what, this is a common, and this particularly is American. Okay? This is an American culture thing. We, we, we should not see ourselves as receiving something from God as much as we see our, ourselves giving ourselves to God. Okay? When we get this idea that, that God, God, save, God saves us through, through his grace and mercy and through Jesus, when we get to the point where we think, well, what all blessings is God going to give me? We've got it turned around. Because when, when we realize that he saved us, we, we spend the rest of our life serving him because we're saved. Not for our salvation, but because we're saved. 
And so it's not about what we receive from God, it's, it's giving ourselves to God. We get distracted by what we feel should be, uh, what we should be getting, rather than who we are becoming. You see, you, you always hear me say, if, if, you're, if your prayer list sounds like a grocery list, okay, if your prayer list sounds like your Christmas list, then you need to reevaluate, reevaluate okay? If that's what your prayer list, if you're praying for things to get from God, and that includes a lot of things. That, is, that, even includes, uh, that can even include healing. Okay? That can include the things that you expect to gain from God. Because that, that takes us away a little bit of our eternal perspective. Because he, he wants us to be able to, 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 to understand where we're headed. Okay? And, and so that can, be, that can be a little stretch for us sometimes. Is we're, we're looking for things for ourselves. Being a true Christ follower is usually glorifying to God when it's not sometimes very glamorous to us. You may be right in the center of where God wants you to be and going through an incredibly hard time of testing. Do you hear that? You may be right in the center of where God wants you to be and it be one of the most difficult times of testing in your life. So don't get distracted. <laughs> don't get distracted by looking for a way out. All right? Don't get distracted by looking for a way out, but do the good work that God has called you to do in the midst of the place that you have. Life may get more difficult. See, Christianity is not a ticket for easy life. That's not what it is, and we shouldn't advertise it as such. Okay? Christianity is not a ticket for an easy life. Life may get more difficult before it gets easier, but you do it all for the glory of your Heavenly Father. Colossians 3.17 says, Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So we stay focused on God's calling on our lives, and we don't allow Satan to distract us. Now, the second thing that Satan uses is fear. The second thing that he uses is fear. Um, and, and, and so we, we're to stay focused on God's calling on our life and not allow Satan to distract us. But, but what happens is the enemy will then use fear to undermine and discredit uh, us. And, and this is what happens here as well. He uses fear to undermine and discredit Nehemiah. But we should remain fearless. We should remain fearless for Jesus when Satan tries to discredit us. And, and, when, and this is what happens. When the distraction tactic doesn't work, okay, because that's a mild one. He comes in that so subtly. It's like, here, you know, we just need you to do this over here. Or we need you to come down for a meeting. Or we need you to come over here. Or we need you to do this. Or we need you to do that. And those things can be very subtle. And you may not even see it. And all of a sudden, you're neck deep in, in, in time commitment. And you're like, wait a minute. I don't have time to do anything that I've been called to do. Yeah, yeah, he, he sucked you right in. And, and so, But if that doesn't work, so it didn't work on Nehemiah. Nehemiah said, no, I'm not coming down for a meeting. I don't have time. we got work to do here. I'm doing a great work. And so four times they asked him to come, four times he gave them the same answer. I don't have time for this. I don't have time for distractions. And so that didn't work. And so when that didn't work, they ramp it up. Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 5, begins to reveal another tactic. Okay? At the fifth time, Sam Ballot sent his aide to me with the same message. And in his hand, notice this. This is important. In his hand was an unsealed letter. Government correspondence in this time was sealed, okay? Uh, and saying that, that, that if this was like a personal message, this was really important that nobody else needed to know, this is a private message, then they put their seal on it, and you best not break that seal, okay? And so, but this was an unsealed letter. And this is what the letter said. Look at this. It is reported among the nations, and Geshem says it's true, that you and the Jews are plotting to revolt, and therefore you're building the wall. Moreover, according to these reports, you're about to become their king and have even appointed prophets to make this proclamation about you in Jerusalem. There is a king in Judah. Now this report will get back to the king, so come, let us meet together. And here's the thing. In this tactical change, we see Sanballat's true colors come out, and this is, this is always a true test of friendship, okay? Because in the first time, it's like, hey, Nehemiah, won't you come down? You know, we'll have some coffee or whatever. We'll talk about what's going on. You know, and it kind of seems like a friendly kind of a, a situation. But he doesn't come. He refuses four times. And so when you refuse somebody who you think is your friend to do what they've asked you to do, that's a test of friendship. Because now 
he turns up the heat. Okay? He turns up the heat and he sends this unsealed letter and, 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 and it's an accusation. Okay? It's an accusation trying to discredit Nehemiah. And it's always a true, true test of friendship. We discover what's really in their hearts. And so he receives this letter. It's an unsealed letter. And, and he's accusing Nehemiah of rebellion against Persia. And, and here's the thing. The more people that know about this accusation, the more trouble it stirs. So I need you to take this unsealed letter to Nehemiah. And as you pass along, now that you have it, you obviously know what's in it. And you can share that information with anybody that you come in contact with. We're spreading gossip, aren't we? You see how that works? See, it's an unsealed letter, and so it's, 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 it's traveling around, and it's moving, and, and so all these things are, are beginning to thing out. Now, here's the thing. It is reported among the nations. <laughs> Satan uses the same strategy today in churches. He uses the same strategy today in churches, but this is what it sounds like. This is what it sounds like in Southern Baptist churches. People are saying... Some, uh, several people are talking, okay? I've heard this before, and you guys have probably heard this before, okay? And so when I hear that, when I see that, shoop, red flag goes up, okay? An attack from Satan comes up, and the flag starts waving, all right? Because here's my immediate question. Well, well people have names, right? People have names. And so if we have concerns among people, then we need to know who those people are, and we need to have a conversation with those people. You typically find out that it's not people, but it's person. And person wants to remain unnamed. Listen, there's no place in a church family ever for discrediting one another. There, there, there are places for seeking God's guidance. There are places for having healthy conversations. Okay, We don't do people are saying. We do, hey, I'm, 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 I'm seeing something and I'm concerned and I want to talk about that concern. You see... And we sit down and we talk about it. And then we identify who's having the concern and we pray about it and we seek God's guidance on it because it's God's plan and it's God's people and it's God's church. It's not, it's not an individual having a, a, an issue. See, it's, it's very, very important. There's no place in a church family for that. There's places for seeking God's guidance and prayer and healthy conversations. This is something else about the strategy that Satan uses. The best lies, okay, in his, in his domain, the best lies have a little kernel of truth in them, okay? The best lies have a little kernel of truth in them. No, no, notice this, verse 7, Nehemiah had no interest in being king, <laughs> okay? Nehemiah didn't come back to be, as a matter of fact, he was supposed to go back to his job, but the prophets had said there would be a king in Judah, and, and, and Nehemiah believed there would be a king in Judah, See, in 2 Samuel chapter 7, verse 16, it says, Your house, your kingdom will endure forever, King David, before me. Your throne will be established forever. So there is a little bit of truth in Sanballat's accusation, but it's all twisted. And that's what happens so many times when, when, when outsiders look in to see uh, God's people. They, they tend to get it confused and they twist everything around. Look at all the efforts in Jesus' day. Look at all the efforts of the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the religious leaders of the day to twist what he said. Every time he would come together, he'd begin to teach, and they would listen to what he said, and they would want to twist it and turn it. It was the same tactic that Satan used there, there the same tactic he used against Jesus. It, it's, it's really sad that I can stand here and, and, and look at the society and the culture that we're living at in America and begin to see that we're living in a post-Christian society. That's troubling. It's very troubling to me. And, and the thing of it is, is that we are insulated from much of that in Ohio County. Okay, We are insulated from that very much in Ohio County. We still have a community that when we have graduation, a student comes forward and prays over that graduation. We still have a community where graduates come to, to, to a baccalaureate service and acknowledge God and that we still live in a beautiful and wonderful community and we should embrace as long as we can. But understand, it is, it is not that way away from our rural community. In, in larger cities, we are seeing corruption and we're seeing problems and we're seeing things unfold in America that's unbelievable. And, and, and so we, we are seeing a, a rapid change. It's not a good change. So more than ever, we have to remain strong and faithful. 
Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 8 and 9. He says, I sent him this reply. Nothing like what you're saying is happening. You're making it up in your head. <laughs> they were all trying to frighten us, thinking their hands will get too weak for the work and it will not be completed. But I prayed, now, strengthen my hands. Listen, in the midst of Satan's attacks, we are able to remain fearless. We don't have to be afraid of his attacks. You see, when, when sheep become aware that there's a lion in the, in the midst, the tendency is to huddle together and quit doing anything and just be in fear. But we don't have to live that way. We can continue to do what we've been called to do. We can continue to be, to be fearless because our God will fight for us. You remember King David when he was just a boy and he went onto the battlefield with Goliath? He's like, hey, I've killed the lion. The lion that was coming to devour my sheep, he, he may have had, they may have been defenseless against him. <laughs> 200 mile an hour, okay? A rock the size of a, of a tennis ball and the upper side of a lion's head. He's nothing. I got it. You see, we have a God that will fight for us. And we need to leave that up to him. Nehemiah didn't have to come off the wall and defend himself. And this is something, when we get, when we get mad, when we get angry, when we get in a place where it's like, you know, something happens or somebody comes against us or does something against us, and it's like, I just want to, you know, I just want to tear into this. I want to do something. Remember this verse, Romans 12, 19. Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath. He'll take care of it. Most of the time when he does, it's to our shock. Trust me. Most of the time, when God's wrath falls on someone for, 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 for attacking or, 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 or trying to disrupt the work of his people, many times when you observe that, you're like, let's take a couple steps back. But it's his decision. It's his judgment. It's not us. Leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. You leave that to him. You leave that to him. When Satan tries to discredit you, you don't have to respond. Allow God to fight your battles. What people think about you matters less than what God knows about you. You hear that? What people think about you matters much, much less than what God knows about you. Let him fight your battles. The opinions of people are less important than the approval of God. That's where we seek approval. So how do we respond? How do we do this fearlessly? Same thing Nehemiah did. You pray. <laughs> you pray. As soon as the criticism came, Nehemiah prayed. Prayer is what brought Nehemiah to rebuild the wall in the first place. He was praying and fasting day and night. And there has to be intentional prayer. The whole reason that he even understood there needed to be a wall is because Nehemiah understood Scripture. Nehemiah understood what had happened in the past. Nehemiah knew who, who God had called. He knew all about their history. He knew the promises of God, and he understood that they had been scattered out, but he had studied the Scripture. Listen, Nehemiah prayed, and he studied the Bible. Okay, now It looked different to him, but he understood the Word. He prayed, and he understood the Word. Folks, it's no different for us. It's no different for us. We have the same thing before us. If we're going to serve God fearlessly, we spend time daily in prayer and in his word. We just spend time daily in, in prayer and in his word. That's why this F-260 plan has been so bold for us. And, and I'm not surprised that we're beginning to see amazing things happen because people are being dedicated to the word. When you're dedicated to the word and you're dedicated to spending time with God, then God will fight our battles for us. God will begin to focus our minds. He will begin to focus our attention and amazing things begin to happen. So we remain focused on Jesus when Satan tries to distract us and we remain fearless for Jesus when Satan tries to discredit us. We have to remain firm in Jesus when Satan tries to deceive us. The final thing this morning. Nehemiah 6.10, this is the last tactic of Satan in this account. One day I went to the house of Shemaiah, son of Deliah, the son of Mehetabel, what a set of names, who was shut up at his home. He said, let us meet in the house of God, inside the temple, and let us close the temple doors, because men are coming to kill you. By night they are coming to kill you. And this is what we need to know about Shemaiah. 
Just because somebody has reverend in front of their name doesn't mean they're called by God. Okay? Just because they have reverend in front of their name doesn't mean they've been called by God. Shemaiah was a false prophet. And, and, and this is how we know. His counsel to Nehemiah was against God's law. And that should never be. You should never have a man of God counsel you to disobey God's law. I've seen it happen. I've seen it happen. I've watched it happen before, and it, it always blows my mind. But it happens. There was a law. Nehemiah was not a priest. <laughs> he could not enter the temple. He was not allowed. He was not allowed inside the temple, but Shemaiah said, that's all right. It's okay. They're going to kill you, so you need to come on in, and we'll shut the doors. So, so look at how it was unfolding here. And Nehemiah 6, 11 says, I said, should a man like me run away? Or should someone like me go into the temple to save his life? I will not go. I will not go. I realized that God had not sent him. He was a false prophet. But he had prophesied against me because why? Oh, there they are again. Tobiah and Sanballat had hired him. He was paid off. He was paid off to try to get Nehemiah to go inside he had been hired to intimidate me so that I would commit a sin by doing this, and then they would give me a bad name to discredit me. Folks, this is Satan's oldest tactic. <laughs> it's his oldest tactic. It goes all the way back to Genesis. Did God really say not to eat of the fruit of this tree? Are you sure? I mean, come on, Nehemiah, just come on inside. I mean, they're going to kill you, so it's okay. It'll be okay. It's, it's a Satan's oldest tactic. Just come on in. Come on, come on inside. Did he really say not to eat this fruit? Come on, Nehemiah. It's for your own good. Be careful. Be careful. Satan uses the same tactics today. Did God really say? I mean, God would want us to be happy, right? Whew. How many how many sins have been precluded by that statement? I mean, come on. Come on. God wants you to be happy, doesn't he? Be careful. It's Satan's oldest tactic. It's his oldest tactic. Satan wants you to believe that your faithfulness will rob you of something. You see, that's what he told Eve. No, what? God doesn't want you to eat the fruit because he knows here that you're going to be like him. You'll be like God. Satan's lies that in order to be happy, you have to have what you want. Okay? In order to be happy to ha and have what you want, you have to, in order then to get that, is to compromise what God says. It's his oldest tactic. If you're really going to be happy in life, then you're going to have to ultimately choose a life of disobedience. That's what he confronted Nehemiah with. If you really want to stay alive, Nehemiah, you're going to have to disobey that little temple rule, that little can't come inside thing, and just come on in here to stay safe. Satan wants you to believe that sin is the only thing way out and listen he'll lure you to the edge and the moment you step over he'll chastise you for it look at you you worthless he'll do it every time he'll lead you all the way to the edge and the moment you step over he'll chastise you Nehemiah 6, 14 and 15 says, Remember Tobiah and Sambalat, my God, because of what they have done. Remember also the prophet Nadiah and how she and the rest of the prophets have been trying to intimidate me. So the wall was completed on the 25th of Elul in only 52 days. Remaining faithful to God's plan is always the best way. Remaining faithful to God's plan is always the best way. Taking shortcuts will always be tempting. I remember when I was just a little kid, about five or six years old, we were at Mammoth Cave for a, a family reunion for the Felty family. And there was a whole bunch of us that went out on a, on a hiking trail. And I've been there multiple times since then. But I remember you can, you can hike along this trail. Some of you may have been there. But as you're hiking along, you can kind of look up the hill and realize that the, the next level of the trail is up there. They've kind of got it carved on the side of the hill so you don't really have to climb real steep. And so if you just kind of go along. But the, but the trail is clean. The trail is nice. The trail is gravel. Uh, the trail is, you know, it's, it's a nice, comfortable walk. It doesn't stress you out. It doesn't really get a whole lot of incline and really get. So the temptation is, is to look up and go, but if we just cut through here, we can get there quicker. And we don't have to do all the winding. 
And so some of the, the cousins, some of our, uh, all of our family, somebody looked and said, hey, we can cut through here. And so they took off going, and we started all going up the hill off the trail. We got about halfway up, and somebody stepped in a yellow jacket nest. And all of the, those, they went up inside of his shirt, and all, he was just eat up. And they were flying everywhere, and they were stinging everybody, and everybody was just running. You see, when we try to go off of God's path, when we try to take shortcuts in life, when we try to go in directions that we're not called, when we, when we don't follow the path that he's laid out for us, it can lead to destruction. But when we remain faithful to Jesus, look what happens. Nehemiah 6, 16. When all of our enemies heard about this, all the surrounding nations were afraid. And they lost their self-confidence. Because they realized that this work had been done with the help of our God. We don't have to be afraid of Satan. We don't have to be afraid of the attacks that will come. We have to be aware of the distractions that come first. We have to be aware uh, of his tactics, of his attempts to discredit. And we also have to be aware of how he comes and how he tries to attack us and how do we fight back <laughs> how do we respond in faithfulness with faithfulness and in prayer and the study of his word is he after you <laughs> he's going to come after after this work he always does are you prepared for that attack are you prayed at are you prayed up have you spent time in the word have you spent time uh, in, in conversation with him if not it's a good time to start. Let me pray for you. Father, we come before you this morning and we thank you so much. Uh, we thank you just for making us aware as we, as we read and study your word, as we see what, uh, uh, what you're up to. Father, we've seen uh, young children come to their parents this week and say, Mom, Dad, I want to ask Jesus into my heart. I want to be saved. I want to I spend eternity in heaven. I, I understand what the Bible is teaching. I understand the gospel message. Time after time, child after child, we've seen that happen. Father, we know that's going to get Satan's attention. We know that he's going to be looking. We know that he is roaming back and forth on this earth, seeking whom he may devour. Father, but we don't have to be afraid. We don't have to be afraid of Satan's attacks. We just need to be prepared. And so, Father, we prepare ourselves... By getting into your word. We prepare ourselves by getting, getting on our knees and before you, Father, every day. By setting down and setting aside intentional time to talk to you. And Father, maybe today is just a moment to go, Whew, that can be hard. <laughs> it sounds easy, but it can be hard. And when we're out of the word, Father, then the attacks come. And we don't know how to respond. And we respond in fear. And we go the other way. Father, this morning I, I, I pray that you just search our hearts. Search our hearts as we seek to respond to you. As we look to see what, uh, uh, what, what you would have us to be doing. Father, let us be found doing your work. Let us be found doing a good work for you, Father. Not being distracted. Not having to, to, uh, to, to go and, and, and to, to deal with what uh, people are making up or whatever. We need to be true in our own character, Father. What you know about us is, is much more important than what people think. So, Father, help us to just be that servant for you. Help us to be that church. Father, continue to bless, continue to guide, continue to lead, Father. We're going to look to you. Father, as you prepare the way <laughs> for what you want to do. Lord, we pray now that we'll respond and reflect, Lord, in the way you've called us. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.